next speaker, we have the wonderful Tim Riley. So this is Tim's second time speaking at uh, RubyConf AU. He did speak two years ago the last time the conference was in Melbourne. Uh, so his talk is on views, and it comes with a bit of disclaimer that these are not the views you're thinking of. Uh, so Tim is a big advocate for Ruby and non-Rails implementations of Ruby. So he works with DryRB and ROMRB, um, and is an open source contributor to both of those, as well as Hanami. Uh, other than preparing for this talk, he hasn't actually written Rails in about three years, but he uses <laughs> Ruby pretty much every day. He's from Canberra. He sort of moved from, I think it was Perth originally, and then like Adelaide. Uh, and he's got to Canberra, and that's as far east as he is going. Uh, apparently, he loves the hot weather, so he made a terrible decision living in Canberra. Uh, he lives there with his two young children. His four-year-old started preschool this week, so that was very exciting. Um, but he's here with us to tell us all about views from the top. Please welcome Tim. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm honoured to be back here today. Um, I come to you uh, from Canberra. Uh, I work at ISLAB. We're a design studio. We do have an office here in Melbourne. And everything I want to talk about today has been proven out in ISLAB on real projects in production across the last several years. And in the Ruby world, I'm part of the DryRB team. And we provide a range of gems to help you write better, more maintainable Ruby code. And today, I'll be speaking about our offering for views. And yes, before long, you'll see this offering making its way into the Hanami project, which, if you haven't heard of it, is a full stack web framework for Ruby. And our two teams have joined forces to work on version two. And we'll be delivering a framework that's optimized for building cleanly architected, modular, monolith first applications, the kind of thing that Kelly described for us yesterday. And I'm super excited for this future. But in our time today, I'd like to do something a little bit different. I want to take you behind the scenes, adopt you as co-workers of mine, and bring you in to a meeting. So let me just uh, get set up. <laughs> um, did anyone bring a whiteboard marker? No? I, I probably can't reach anyway, so we'll deal with some comic sans then. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Uh, I know your time is precious, and for some reason, this meeting room is just booked out solid today. Um, I think we've got maybe 19 minutes left together, so we'll get into it. We're here because we've decided it's time we do something about our views. And I have to say it these days, I'm not talking about anything that runs inside the browser. I'm talking about the humble server-rendered view. And these things, they continue to be important in our apps, and if I think about it, probably across the whole internet at large. But for something so essential, I have to say, things have gotten out of hand. Our views, at least, just feel like a mess. And I know they're kind of special because they occupy this intersection between Ruby code and markup, between Ruby developers and front-end developers. And that does mean they can become prone to becoming messy, but I don't think that's an excuse. We can and we should be trying to do better. But we can't continue to write views in the same way and somehow expect to get different results. And the truth is, we're writing views in pretty much the same way as they shipped in Rails 1.0. That's kind of damning if you think about it. Nearly 15 years have passed since then. Collectively, have we learned nothing in that time about how to write better views? Rails 1 shipped back in 2005, and if you cast your mind back, you might remember that as the year that Vin Diesel shipped the pacifier. <laughs> now, this might not be the most glorious moment in cinema history, but as a point in time, I think it's interesting, because since then, we've seen Mr. Diesel go on and relentlessly iterate. <laughs> With every one of his subsequent releases, he becomes faster and more furious. <laughs> but our views in this time, well, they haven't changed. That's what makes me furious. And I, I don't think it's just that we're writing bad code. I think it's this whole approach to views that has issues. So let's just review that situation now. We'll start with controllers. So while the HTTP processing layer is where we often want to render a view, there shouldn't have to be that views forever home. That's just mixing too many responsibilities together. And well, helpers, what can I say? It might look like we organize these things, what with all those modules we create, but 
In the end, they all get mixed together into this big global soup of implicitly interdependent methods put together into a context we have no control over. And I've asked around the team uh, in the last few days, and no, none of you feels good about writing a helper. It's just something we do when we feel like we have no better option. And yes, for a while we felt like some add-on decorator gems might be a better option, but it turns out they occupy this kind of uncanny valley of view libraries. They're helpful, yes, but because they're not native to the view system, they lack certain abilities. And because these are opt-in additions, it's always felt like there's a little bit too much friction around using them. So, these lack of good options in the end has meant we just end up with too much logic cluttering our templates. And that's where we'd much rather be clean of code and clear of mind to focus on things like markup and presentation. So I think with this approach, it's just too hard to write good view code. And really, what we should be striving for is for our view code to be good anything code. Just because, we're not in, just because we're in the views, it doesn't mean we should sacrifice all the good guiding principles that we try to apply to other parts of our code bases. So let's fix this together today. Let's build a better view system. And we should have published this as a gem, of course, and we'll call it dry view. So hey, thanks for taking all the time to consider this uh, meeting after I sent you the invite um, and sending me those requirements you put together for how we should build better views. And after looking them over, I think there's a way we can bring them together into a nice, coherent system. So the first one of your requirements is that views should be a thing. They should be an object, something that we can address directly and pass around. So we'll start with that. Let's start by defining a class we'll inherit from DriveView. And then, yes, looks like we can make this into an object in typical Ruby style. And then we'll make it so our views can have some dependencies injected as well. This means they can cleanly collaborate with whatever other parts of our application they might need to go ahead and do their job. So today we'll be building a view for showing an article, nice and simple. So in this case, we want to give it an article repository so it can load articles from the database. And then we can pass it in when initializing the view, just like so. So now we have views as objects. The next thing you said was that we should be explicit about declaring what values we make available to our templates, because we are crossing a boundary at that point. We should be purposeful about it. So I think we can solve this by adding exposures to our view. So in this case here, we'll expose just a single article. And inside our exposures, we'll do whatever we need to prepare their values. So for here, we'll want a slug to be passed to us and then we'll work with our article repository to find the matching record from our database. And then if we are going to pass this to a template, well, let's give ourselves a place to specify that template's name. And that brings us to your next requirement. Yes, you say we still should build these things with templates, and I'm good with that too. We're comfortable working with them, and they're still a great place for our front-end developers to go to work as well. So here's our template for today. We'll build this one with the slim template language, and what we're doing here is we're just putting a header on our page and using that article we exposed earlier to fill it in. So with that template in place, well, we can go back to our view object and call it, passing in a slug for the article. And look, here is our rendered view. Nice and simple. One, two, three, I think we are done. Early mark, everyone. No? No, you're saying we've got the basics, but there is more we can do. Yes, we wanted to use templates, but we don't want to get mired in that morass of complex logic that weighed us down before. We want our template code to be simple and to push as much logic into other parts of our view system. Let's look at some aspect of this logic now. So here's how we might have used a template before, a helper before, to render an article's body from its markdown source. Now the downside to using helpers like this is that we now have to remember to use it in every single place we deal with an article. And then the accumulation of hundreds of these across a whole range of concerns is what got us into this mess in the first place. Now this, this is more like what you wanted to see in our templates. The view-specific behavior hanging off the values that we passed to the template in the first place. And yes, what we're seeing here is some kind of decorator object in action. Something that wraps the value we pass in from our exposure and carries that view-specific behavior. 
Well, let's build one of these now. We'll call these parts. And this one here will carry the behavior for articles. So that gives us a place to put this body HTML method right there alongside the article's own data. So now we've simplified our templates, and we've taken care of the other side of that equation, which is to decorate our objects, uh, decorate our exposure values with objects carrying that view-specific behavior. Now, this next requirement of yours is an interesting one. I can see you've looked at how we worked with decorators in the past, and you realized, well, a decorator is only so good if we actually use it. So what you want is a system that nudges us towards the right abstractions every time so that things like decorators can be made automatically right from the beginning. And I think we found a way to make this work. If we go back to our view and configure a part namespace, then we can make it so the value from every exposure automatically gets wrapped in a matching part object. And that does this just by matching by name. So all we need to do is create that part class, and it'll get picked up automatically. And this means we'll be much more inclined to turn to these when we have to add extra view logic. OK, so for this one, I get what you're saying. You're saying, if we need to do our own take on decorators, well, we should make this worth our while and close the gap that we felt before when using those add-on decorator systems. What you want to see is parts become fully integrated with the rest of our system so that anything we can do in templates, we should be able to do in parts as well. So let's find a way to make this work. We'll go back to our article template and say we need to put a sharing widget at the bottom. Classic client request, am I right? Well, the markup here is pretty tedious, and we have to do, pass in all the different aspects of our article that we want to appear in this widget. Now, at this point, we, we might realize that this is a fairly self-contained component, and it's something we want to reuse, so we'll extract it into a partial. And yes, we still have partials in this system. You can see us working with one here via the render method. But even with the partial in place, we still have all this awkward attribute passing every time we want to use it. So how about this? What if we could render partials from within our view parts, just like we can in templates? This means we can now move everything right here into this article part class and hide away the particulars of the rendering. And that means we end up with this much cleaner, much more intention-revealing template. Now, that's the kind of outcome we wanted to see from having view facilities that are fully integrated. Things are feeling pretty good now, but I see a few of you still pointing out a gap. You're saying with parts, well, we figured out a way to add view-specific behavior around particular values. But what about behavior that doesn't live alongside any one value, behavior that might go along more with a template or with a partial? And I noticed a few of you shared an example where something like this could help, like here, with this related article partial. Now, this rendering, it looks pretty innocuous. But if we dig inside, then <sighs> this is some pretty hairy looking template code. Uh, it's just some logic I don't like to see in templates. In fact, if I see the defined keyword anywhere, uh, I know something has probably gone wrong. But I can see what we're trying to do here. We're, we're trying to make it so that if this partial is rendered without these locals explicitly passed in, well, then we want to provide some default values. But I still think this is a wrong-headed approach. Hang on a second. Did I write that code? Good thing Tekken taught us some things yesterday. OK. All right, that one is on me. But I'm glad we're working on this together, because you thought of a concept to clear all of this up. Alongside our parts, we'll add scopes. Let's build up a scope for this related article partial now. So while with parts, we found a way to deal with a single value, the idea for scopes is that they can deal with whole templates. And that means we can give them access to that template's complete set of locals. And that means we now have a chance to write methods that properly handle a missing local and can provide it a default value in its place like this one here, for whether or not to show the author, author on this related article. And then we can do it again for providing a default for the prefix text that we want to have in the link. And in fact, we can go one step further, combine that prefix with the article's title to give us the text in full. And that means we can remove that founder's code of mine and end up with this much nicer template using the scopes methods to tidy everything up. 
Now, to make sure our partial is rendered with that scope, we want to build it up first, still pass it the same name, still pass it the article, then tell the scope to render itself, and it'll go ahead and pick up that existing partial. So this list is looking pretty complete now. We're really done at this point, right? Wait. You want to add helpers back after everything I said? OK. I, I, I see there's a fair case for this. There is likely going to be a small number of things that are truly common to all views and their templates, some kind of baseline rendering context. Well, let's take that name and go ahead and make it the name of a new facility, a context object. And just like views, the context may want to interact with other parts of the app so we can inject some dependencies again. Here we're passing in a static assets manifest, the kind of thing that Webpack will generate for us externally. And then we can write a method that works with that manifest and gives us the full asset path for any given name. And then to tie everything together, we'll make it so that whatever methods we define in this context class are also available to use in any template, just like that. And then also, because we care about our view facilities being integrated, we'll make those methods available inside our parts and scopes as well. So this means we can continue to keep our view logic in the best possible places while still taking advantage of every feature of our view system. And I like this point you make too. You're saying that while these might feel like helpers in their end usage, that's the only thing they share in common with the helpers we had before. Because in practice, these are regular methods defined in a regular class with its own state and its own clear dependencies. Now that's something we can definitely keep on top of and much more easily refactor over time. So I think we've made it now, and it's not just because we're out of space on our giant whiteboard. I think we've given this system everything it needs. And we did that by working through those requirements you shared and using them to help us discover the concepts around which we could better organize our views. We started with views themselves, views as standalone objects, carrying configuration, dependencies, declaring exposures. And those exposures prepare the values that we want to pass to our templates. The templates define the markup that gives us our view output. And then if we want to add extra behavior around specific values, well, we have parts. And we have the same thing with scopes, which give us behavior around templates or partials. And then we have the context, just to tie everything together and give us the things that we want in every place. Well, that was a pretty fun ride. But I think it's good at this point just to step back and ask, well, what have we learned by going through this process of invention? Well, I think we rightly recognized that views are complex. And they're complex enough that templates and helpers are just not up to the task of handling them anymore. In working through those requirements, we ended up creating a whole six different places to keep our view logic, with each one of those serving a distinct and necessary role. And I don't think this is just architecture for the sake of it. This really feels like minimum viable views. Each one of these facilities exists to help us write better view code. And if we took any away, our view code is going to get worse. And the benefit of having all those structures there right from the get-go is that they make the easy thing to do also the right thing to do. And when those things align, that's when the quality of our, quality of our code can really level up. Let's just look at some of the outcomes we're going to get from this. By representing our views as standalone objects and clearly uh, injecting the other parts of our application that they need to do their job, we've enabled a clean separation of concerns. We've disentangled the views from the rest of our app and let them stand apart in a truly distinct layer. And then by moving the bulk of our view logic into part and scope object, objects, at last, we're properly encapsulating that logic, taking our custom behavior and putting it into the same place as the data that it relates to. And all of these different objects in our view system, we design them to be immutable so that once they're initialized, their state will never change. This means they're easier to understand on their own, and it gives us a much clearer flow of data throughout all of our views. And all of this makes for a view layer that is now far easier to test. We can now unit test our views more than ever before, and at whatever level of granularity makes the most sense. So say we have a part or a scope with some complex behavior. Well, now we can unit test those single methods directly. Or if you want to test a view in full, 
Well, we can build up a view object, pass in some test values as input, and then make assertions against its output text. And we can do this in complete isolation. No web request, no database access required. And this ease of testing really brings home the lesson here, I think, that better view code is just really better object-oriented code, full stop. This is something we should be striving for in every aspect of our applications, and views should be no exception. And better OO code gives us views that are a joy to write again, views that we can be proud of, views that we can trust will work in the way we intend, and views we're happy to come back to months into the future when we have to maintain them. And that's what helps us do our jobs better and build better applications. And whether folks use Drive View or not, hopefully these ideas at least can help push their views in a better direction. But I think this is about more than just writing better apps. I think this is about helping to create a better and stronger Ruby ecosystem. Because in creating a new view system, we've created some choice, and choice leads to diversity. And through diversity, we have the healthy sharing of ideas that helps to drive our community forward. And importantly, what we've created here is open to everyone because it's a standalone system. As long as you use Ruby, you're good to go, no matter what flavor of web framework is your preference. And then once you are using it, how you use it is up to you. Yes, go ahead and render web responses, but hey, use this same view system for emails so you can uh, take advantage of all the same facilities. Heck, if you want, render your views in the background because this thing is standalone, it's flexible, and how you use it is up to you. And in building this, what we've done is innovated, and innovated in a space that's been largely stagnant for those whole 15 years. We felt like the existing tools were, were getting in the way of us writing good view code, and so we did something about it. And it turns out this solution was about 900 lines of Ruby code. None of this was rocket science. Any one of us here could do it. And what we've shown everyone is that while many may consider the Ruby story to be settled, there is always the opportunity to take another look at something fundamental and offer a new and interesting take. So what did we do? Well, we invented DriveView together and we gave ourselves the chance to finally write some better views again. And with that, I think someone else needs the meeting room, so I will wrap this up. I'm Tim, please come have a chat. I'd love to talk about views or anything else. Uh, the DryRB website has more information there. So thanks for coming, and I'll see you at tomorrow's stand-up. <laughs>